Hi, hello. Nice to be here. Okay, so about me, I have been doing embedded uh, systems for 14 years. I do kernel and user space work. Um, I authored and maintained libukv, which is the subject of this talk, and I maintain the GPIO kernel subsystem in the Linux kernel. Uh, I also contribute to to uh, various open source uh, projects, including various Yocto layers. And uh, since recently, I, I started maintaining the uh, LVGL stack in Zephyr. So uh, this talk, uh, before I dive into the LibGPIB itself, I, I will just do a little recap of uh, why we're doing it. So it turns out that despite uh, our best efforts as uh, maintainers of GPIO or the GPIO subsystem in the kernel, people still want to use, uh, still want to control uh, input output ports from user space for various reasons, uh, mostly for prototyping and, and also for uh, simple, uh, for, for user space control over various uh, switches, buttons and, and, and sensors that don't, not necessarily have or require a Linux kernel driver. Uh, or for devices that don't really plug in well into any of the existing uh, Linux subsystems. So for that, the Linux uh, kernel exposes a GPIO uh, character device per chip, uh, or rather, should I say, per bank, uh, per GPIO bank, um, and it exists in, in slash dev uh, as GPIO chip number. Uh, and this uh, interface has been around since 2016. It's meant to replace the old uh, SysFS uh, class that was uh, that was an earlier invention. Uh, and unlike the SysFS, which is uh, accessible using uh, command line tools and, and basically with with, with uh, some simple scripts, this uh, interface consists of uh, a bunch of IOCTLs and uh, C data structures. And that is pretty pretty cumbersome to use. So libgpid's uh, goal is to wrap that functionality first into a uh, higher level C library, then uh, high level languages bindings, and uh, eventually command line tools uh, that can be used in scripts. Uh, oh, the animations don't seem to work. Okay, so this was supposed to be animated anyway. So this is uh, the the whole software stack uh, going down from the hardware where we have this specific GPIO drivers in the kernel um, that use the interfaces provided by GPIO lib, which is the subsystem code in the kernel. Then we have the layer that exposes the character device. We cross the boundary into user space. And now this is the part where GPIO, libgpio D lives. Uh, we have the C library, then we have the language bindings. We have the shell tools and users can build their user programs on top of uh, languages and obviously shell scripts using GPIO tools. Uh, so I wrote that uh, summer in like the first version was written in summer in 2017 and um, uh, coming from more like in kernel development, I, I, I learned very fast that uh, API design is hard. So I, uh, used the old uh, Soviet method of reconnaissance in, in force when writing that I would just uh, work with use cases and then uh, write C code. And it turned out it's a problem when, when the library was for, was finally released with a, with a stable API that uh, certain um, shortcomings became visible. Um, and uh, so I lessons learned from, 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 from that period is that uh, always, you should always plan to throw one away. And when looking around, it's true that most projects, uh, like most libraries, have uh, versions two that are much more successful than, than versions one, uh, that are incompatible due to various API reworkings. And uh, certain things to look out for is that uh, when I was writing the GPID, it was like a home project, and, and then it turned out that people actually started using it and, and started sending me email with uh, bug reports and questions. Why does it work like this? Or why, why was this um, done this way? Um, and uh, also you should uh, think about whether the users that will be the target of tar target audience of your projects are experts, because it turns out that many um, people that work with hardware are not necessarily expert programmers. And if you make your API uh, difficult to use, they will bounce off it and or, or bombard you with email about uh, things that you would assume are obvious. And also uh, another thing is that uh, when you try to write a uh, 
an interface in a programming language that you don't know very well, uh, then you can get into trouble. Uh, at the time when I when I started writing the C C++ bindings for the GPIOD, I, I wasn't really uh, an expert. I'm still not an expert in C++, but uh, when, when, when I wrote it uh, for the first time, it turns out it was actually low quality C++. Uh, so uh, we had actually the same problems with the Linux uh, Carter device interface, the user API. Because when we wrote it, uh, we had something very minimal in mind, so that not to tempt users to overuse it. Uh, but uh, the minimal, uh, the, the minimalism aspect of it uh, made it so that it was really impossible when uh, to modify it when, when users came up with valid reasons for modifying it. Uh, and th th those reasons were something like we can uh, watch, we can monitor uh, interrupts from user space, but we cannot set the debounce period, so that, that makes it uh, not very reliable. Uh, we don't have uh, sequence numbers in edge events when, when we get them in, in user space. We cannot set uh, the internal internal um, pull-up, uh, pull-down resistors, which we can from the kernel. Uh, kernel has uh, different clocks that can be used for time stamping. Uh, we, we couldn't modify them uh, or set them from user space. Uh, we cannot, uh, we don't have any means of getting notified about changes in line status. So when lines get uh, requested or uh, released. And finally, this is a new development. Uh, people are asking to get the, the PI, the process ID of the consumer in user space so that one process can figure out what other process is actually holding uh, holding given GPIO line. So all these were very much uh, valid uh, use cases and uh, space for improvement, but it turns out that we could not uh, modify the existing kernel interface because we didn't left and we didn't leave any padding in the structures that we are exposing and, and, uh, and other reasons too. So before I go into libgpiod, oh, okay. So uh, now we do have the character device version two IOCTL um, interface in, in the kernel, which is much more, uh, which offers a lot of, like already implements a lot of those features that I, I spoke about here. And also is, uh, has some space for future improvements if that's needed. So before I go into the PPOD itself, um, I would love to say that it's out yet, but it's not. Uh, the, the work is still kind of in progress. Most of it is complete. We have uh, completed the API for C and C++, uh, and now we need, still need to uh, update the Python bindings. And we have some tools, some changes queued for the command line tools. Um, I already committed to a date uh, some time ago and, and uh, didn't make it, so I'm, I'm not uh, saying that uh, this will be released in a month or two. I'm, I'm, I would just say that it will be released when it's ready. So libgpiod v2. Uh, the goals for the for the new major release was to make the usage more intuitive, um, make it uh, as difficult as possible to commit programming errors. And also when using high level bindings, uh, allow for concise code. So basically use whatever uh, syntax um, advantages and a high level language provides to, uh, to, 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 to make the code as, as brief as possible. And also uh, don't try to needlessly represent the kernel model as it exists in the kernel, which was one of the reasons why the previous API was so cumbersome. So yeah, this was also support, supposed to be animated. Um, so this is the model basically that we have in the kernel. So we have the providers, these are the GPIO chips and consumers, whatever device, whatever device driver needs to control these GPIOs. And what you do uh, in the kernel is that the driver will request a line or a set of lines for exclusive usage, making it impossible for anyone else to, um, to request it. Uh, and we uh, we followed that model in, or I followed that model in, in, in LibGPA DV1, where you would have objects. So I'm, I'm not going to bother you with code snippets because nobody, it's, it's, it's boring. I will rather describe the, the API in terms of uh, data structures and, and their relationships. Uh, so we have the chip structure and you would get your line or get a set of lines and then you would keep those objects alive and you would uh, you would uh, run all your operations on these objects whether they are requested for exclusive usage or not 
you, you, you would continue to use that, uh, of the, that line object. I'm, I'm sorry, are you still there? Because the, the camera from the, from the room stopped. I don't see anything. So. Okay. Oh, okay. Uh, I, I will just keep on uh, presenting. I'm not sure if you're hearing me. Um, so in V2, we're still going to have the chip object. But for the information about chips or lines, we're going to get immutable snapshots of information, unlike where you just read, uh, you, unlike uh, like in, in, the, in the V1, where you would read properties of those line objects, regardless whether they're, um, they're, they're requested or not, uh, whether their, their status in user space is up to date with uh, what we have in the kernel. Here we're very being very clear in, in view two that what you get when you request chip info line for line info are really immutable snapshots of information. Um, so for requesting okay. lines, what we did in uh, V1 was we would have a single request config. Um, and whether we would reconfigure the lines or request them for the first time, we would use the same, uh, despite the fact that certain properties would not be suitable for reconfiguring an existing request, that would be quite unclear. So we split that into two. Right now, when requesting, we use the request config and line config. And when we are re reconfiguring an existing request, all we use is a line config. So uh, this is it. Um, Next, uh, next thing in the model overhaul is uh, reading line events. So this is one of the main uh, functionalities where you can uh, you can set up callbacks for your. Uh, That's the local. Uh, sorry. Hello. Hello. Are you hearing me? I'm, I'm not sure if you're hearing yeah, me. Yeah, no. Okay, so sorry. The the room got dropped out or something. So you have to go back a little bit. Sorry oh, for that. To... We tried to tell you, but we, we completely lost you. But where, you where, keep where, going. Where, where, when, when did you lose me? This there. there. When, okay. when you started that slide, basically. Okay, sorry. Uh, yeah, I was thinking because I, I, I stopped seeing the input from the room and I wasn't sure if, if you were still there. Okay. Uh, where was I? Okay, so um, I, I said I'm, I'm not going to bore you with code snippets because uh, that's, that's, not, that's usually not very clear. Uh, instead, I will talk uh, in terms of uh, more data structures and the relationship between them. So V1, V1 what we would do, we would represent the kernel's uh, chip as a chip structure, and then we would represent each line as its own line structure, and you would get lines uh, separately or, or in bulk. Um, and this line, like this line object, would then be used to uh, retrieve information about the line status, uh, read its value, wait for interrupts. It would live throughout, um, it, it would be closely tied to the chip, so you would not be able to drop this chip structure as long as you have your line. And this is not very clear because, for instance, you, the line state can have changed in the kernel, but you don't have any information about that. Uh, you, you would have to manually update that, that state. So what we uh, did for information in the V1 is we had now immutable snapshots of information. So when you have your chip and you get your chip information or get your line information, you get a structure with certain properties that you can read. But this is clearly said in the documentation that this is an immutable snapshot only valid at the time of the call. So if something changes uh, in the kernel, it, this, this, this snapshot may no longer be valid. But about that in a second, uh, how we can now get in, informed about those changes in, in the kernel. Uh, so requesting lines. So what you do with your chip structure, you want to request your lines from user space for exclusive usage. So previously, we would have a single big config structure that would also be uh, open coded in the header file, which was uh, also a big, big no in, 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 in Celia libraries. Uh, so when, whenever you would uh, request the lines or reconfigure an existing uh, request, you would use the same structure, but certain properties would not be suitable for a reconfiguring of, uh, of the request. So that would be not very clear, would lead to errors. Um, so for v2, we split that configuration into two parts. So we have the request config and the line. Have, have I been dropped again? 
don't know if you can hear it. Fine. Okay, can you hear me? Because I, 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 the, the on-site room uh, icon just, just was okay. I can't even. Um, so now for for V2, we have uh, split it into two uh, configs. We have the request config that is usable only at the request time, and it's in conjunction with line config, which you use for setting lines, uh, configuring various line settings. About that in in a minute as well. And line config, which can be used for reconfiguring an existing request. So that is all. To, that is in order to make it uh, clearer and easier to use. Uh, one of the main functionalities uh, with of, of libgpld, what you can do with those requested lines, is uh, waiting for interrupts and reacting to interrupts in user space. Uh, so previously, you, you still have that line object, and you. Well, once you requested it for reading events, you, you call uh, a function called GPID line event read. Um, and you would do that for each line, or you could, of course, do that in, in, in sets. Uh, but we thought that it's uh, much better to do it differently. So the request, when you get the file descriptor user space for the line request, it actually can live independently from the chip. So we created this new structure uh, that is called the request, line request. Uh, which you can use for uh, everything from reading and writing and, and setting uh, GPIO values to also reading the edge events, which, which is how we refer to those GPIO interrupts. Uh, and we have another structure that is called edge event buffer. Uh, this edge event already existed previously. So what happens now is you allocate your edge event buffer. This is the buffer that stores, keeps the memory basically for those events, because if you have lots of events, you don't want to reallocate those events all the time. So this is where, where they are stored. You read it from the request, you read your uh, specific event, and uh, only if you want to, you can copy that event. But uh, in general, the memory itself is stored in the edge event buffer, which makes it uh, much more efficient in terms of uh, memory allocations. Next thing, so now, now I'm going to go into the new features. So I said before that we did not have previously any way of being notified about changes in uh, line state, uh, which means if is the, is, has the line been requested or has the line uh, been released or has its config changed. So right now we have new uh, a, a, a new interface that is called line watch, where you can basically use your chip and set a watch on a line or a set of lines and then be notified with something called an info event uh, about changes in, in the line state. The info event actually internally contains this immutable snapshot of the new line information. So you can imagine that you can have your first uh, line info that you got when, when, when first opening the chip, and then every time something changes, you get a new info event describing exactly what the diff between the two is, whether this line and this line has been requested, released, and so on. Uh, next fe new feature, well, this is still the, 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 the previous one. So this, this is how it works. Uh, you have your chip, then you call your watch line info on a line. You see that the line info that you retrieved with this call, uh, you see that the, the line is not used. The used field is false. And then you, from the kernel or from user space, someone requests this line. You are notified about, like, your, your file descriptor uh, says there is something to read on it. You read your event, and now you see in this line info contained in this info event that the line is now used, uh, which is how you can keep track of what's happening to the lines that you're observing. Uh, so, oh, this is, this, is, this is the thing I mentioned previously. So it's, it's, it's a better uh, demonstration of the mechanism. So you have your request, you read your edge event, edge event into your edge event buffer, and now you say, okay, let give me this event. This will only give you the address of the event stored in the buffer, but you can also copy it. And uh, then you have uh, a, a, an event that will live, that will outlive the, the, the parent buffer, so to say. And this is actually, like this, this mechanism is uh, used in, in a, I think, a nice way in C++ where this is done seamlessly. So as long as you get a constant reference, your event buffer is you, you you're not copying anything uh, if you call a, a non-constant uh if you call it in, in a way that the, the, you you'll get a non-constant reference uh to this object you will actually uh copy it you will actually be able to copy it uh to to, to some other user into a different object so now how do we configure um the the lines for for request. So previously, I was I was mentioning we had this big structure with various uh, configuration options. 
uh, what is a very major feature of the new kernel interface is that we can now have a compound configuration. So you previously, when you did a request of a line, you needed to have uh, a, a very, very like the, the, the same use the same configuration for all requested lines. This is no longer the case. Uh, now we can have compound, very compli complicated uh, properties for settings for lines. So you can have a single line in output, uh, another line in input and wait for events, another line in input, but don't really wait for events and set uh, pull up uh, resistor for one, don't set it for, for others. Uh, this is what, what the new kernel API uh, allows. And for that in the library, we represent that uh, in the following way. So we have, um, the, the bottom structure is line settings. This is just a, a, a structure that contains a set of line settings. These are not all of them, but just uh, examples. So you, you can see that this line settings object contains, uh, specifies that any line using this settings object will have uh, its direction and input and will listen for both edge events and, and so on. Uh, so now a line config object, what it does, it stores mappings of offsets to line settings. So what you do now is when, when you're preparing to request your lines, you create your line settings, you can have multiple, and then you map those to offsets. So you say offsets within the chip, of course, with, like we were talking about the hardware offsets of the lines with the chip, uh, three and five take this, uh, take these settings. So offset one takes this setting and, and so on. And uh, yeah, and so then, and, and then what you do is you request your lines, you get a single request object, which is internally presented by a single file descriptor um, on, on the kernel user space boundary. Uh, and you can use all these offsets uh, within, within the sing, single request, whatever the configuration is. Um, so this, this, this is how it works. Uh, Next feature is we now have uh, sequence numbers. So this was a request where, where, where people would play with uh, bit banging, uh, some other protocols. They, they would want to have their, uh, want, want to be sure that the line, that the, the, the events arrive uh, the correct sequence and correct order. So we now have like the edge event structures that we expose now have line sequence, which means that sequence numbers, which means that uh, we increase it every time I'm sorry, an event happens on a single line and we have global uh, chip-wide sequence numbers. That means that this is increased for every line that uh, from this single chip that has been requested within this request. Uh, so you can see that you have first event, both are one. Second event, this is still offset zero, both are set to two. Uh, third event is another, is a different offset. So now we're only increasing uh, the, the, the line sec number for this line will, for this line will be one, but we're still using the global sec, sequence, sequence numbers, sequence number, and then we have, and again, uh, an event for the offset zero. So both are increased. So basically this one to three and, and the global to four. So you can now keep track exactly, uh, of how the kernel sees the events. Uh, okay. So for testing, uh, we, for libgkr dv one, we had this testing, um, kernel module that was called GPI mockup, but this was very old invention and quite cumbersome as well. So we have written an entirely new testing module for GPIO in, in the kernel module for, for testing GPIO from user space, which is called now GPIO sim. Uh, this, unlike the GPIO mockup, doesn't require module reloading when it's, uh, when the configuration for the chips, uh, for the simulated chips needs to be changed because it's much more flexible. It uses config FS for configuration, which you can simply change in real time uh and modify your layout of your chip so this is how it works you have your config fs uh, file system you create uh config fs basically work it's, it's like the reverse of sysfs if, if you're not familiar uh, inside you create your device as represented by a directory then you create your gpio bank or multiple banks per device you enable it by writing to a specific attribute and the new GPIO device, the simulated GPIO device pops up in SysFS and, and, and dev, of course, and it can now be used and can be controlled from SysFS using dedicated attributes uh, so that you can set the value that the user using the character device sees. And this is how we, uh, this is the, the interface that we're using for testing both LibGPIO D and uh, the kernel UAPI. 
Uh, okay, so implementation-wise, in C, we went uh, with opaque objects so that we can easily extend them. Uh, same for C++. Python interface, uh, I, I've, been, I've been given a lot of advice on how to make Python interfaces in, in Python, so I'm, I'm, uh, I'm trying to make this one uh, much more uh, much more stick to what, whatever PPs uh, recommend. And we have uh, Rust bindings that are coming up, uh, thanks to uh, Viresh Kumar, who's working on that at uh, Linaro. Um, we also, as I said before, we have the command line tools uh, in LibGPIOD. So they are getting a rework. We will have a new program, which will be called GPIO Watch. This is the one that will allow you to monitor uh, changes to GPIOs in the kernel. Uh, we will have something that uh, has been long requested, uh, and that is the interactive mode for GPIO sets. So you will not be forced to just run your GPIO set and, and put it in the background or, or just keep it uh, in, in, in your script, uh, like an open existing process. Uh, you, will, can, you will be able to run GPIO set in the background and then open a pipe to it and, and simply send commands uh, to change values or, or yeah, to change, change the configuration of the lines using uh, using the interactive mode just by human readable strings. And also we will uh, put more emphasis on, emphasis on specifying the lines by name because it's much clearer than just using uh, offsets and translating them uh, manually using the GPIO find utility. So this is just an example of how the new command line will, will now look uh, like. So we're, we're pushing for uh, human readable strings instead of numbers and this makes it much clearer so all that what I what I uh, why am I speaking about all of that so this is an example of how uh, how the high, how a high level uh, language will you use the underlying interface to make it as uh, as clear as, as possible so this is just an example of C++ where you're using these uh, chain mutators uh, rust like uh, to set the, config the configuration uh, for a request in a single line, basically you have multiple lines, but technically it's, it's a one-liner and uh, you do your request and then you do whatever with this request structure. You, you have uh, lots, of, lots of interfaces for interacting with it, but this is how you would request the, a set of three lines for input and reading line events in C++ and, and this is a uh, another example, and this time in Python, where you would uh, use the uh, position uh, positional arguments to just specify the config, uh, request the lines, and then read events and print them because these events are printable. Uh, so the libgpod lives here. This is uh, the Git repo. Uh, you can have a lot of reference. You can see for reference the tools, tests, and and high level language bindings, for example. Uh, this is the branch in this repo that contains all the changes that are queued for the next release. Development happens on the Linux GPIO mailing list, uh, just the regular rules for mailing list here. And uh, yeah, if, if you want to help us review or uh, request any features before we, we make the API and ABI stable, uh, please reach out to me. Uh, special thanks to Kent Gibson, who's done a lot of work on the kernel side of the GPIO, of, of the GPIO Carter device and the GPIO as well, and reviews all my patches too. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm open for questions if we have time. I don't know, probably we, we don't have much time left, uh, but we had this technical break. So I have a, a really quick question, Bartosz. Sure. So thanks very much for the presentation and apologies for the brief uh, audio interruption. Um, so this is, this is going to sound a little bit crazy, but, but I had to implement something recently where I was bit banging spy on GPIO on an 80 megahertz microcontroller and I, the um, latency was too much. So I'm sure you get bit banging questions all the time, but, <laughs> and hear me out. Have you ever considered, uh, hooking into IOU ring for programmable GPIO, <laughs> even though that sounds really kind of off the wall? Yeah, this, this is this is uh, like IOU ring would be something like what uh, what the Raspberry Pi library uses, just you know, MFD uh, directly. And uh, I have considered that, but uh, I don't think anyone would be happy with that. Uh, and I have no. done any, any work in, <laughs> in that direction. So I understand I understand the, the rationale be, be, be behind that, but. Uh, 
So we have another question coming here from the Ulm. Yeah, so related to this uh, bit banking, maybe you can put like a BPF program in the kernel and have that do the protocol bit bank. It's, it's funny because the same thing came up during the GPIO ball on Monday. Uh, that, was, I, that was from me. Okay. <laughs> I don't think that was me. <laughs> yeah. Um, I admit that I would have to educate myself on eBPF. I have not yet uh, discovered all the all the possibilities. Uh, it does sound like uh, like a solution, and uh, I I I'm not sure would would anyone in the Linux among the Linux maintainers be happy with with a solution like that? Is that what eBPF uh, is 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 meant for? That's a question. I I, I really don't know. And you would still have to cross the well, there, um, yeah. I don't know if it's relevant, but I know um, Benjamin, I'm not sure how to say his last name, but he's doing it with HID. Um, he gave mm -hmm. a talk about it at Embedded Recipes, which is kind of interesting to like control what a HID device can do. Yeah. So. I mean, he gave the same talk here, so but oh, he used okay. it mostly for like um, having a faster development cycle with the user. So like giving the user like a something he can run there and stuff like recompiling the kernel and doing all the debugging there. So that was like one mechanism for him to make it a lot easier. I think the quirks still end up in the in HID in the, in the kernel side, but it's like one mechanism for him to help there. I mean, yeah, eBPF is interesting for some for some subsystems, but if it's really going to fit for you, I think it would really up to the GPO maintainers to look and, and think if it's like worthwhile to, to do that. I mean, there's no general rule for that. Okay, I think we need to need to close down. You have one quick question or? Um, actually, just a comment. As far as I understand the uh, eBPF part from Benjamin, they plan to replace all the little hit drivers in the kernel with little eBPF programs in the user space. Okay. Which would then be compiled and injected into the kernel. Okay, so maybe I need to look at that again because I was understanding it differently, but it's fine. Okay, um, thank you. So there's no more questions. Okay, so we have like, uh, thanks Bartosz. Yeah.